Sooner or later, each of us will die. But when? On what basis? Should anybody rightly be considered dead? This is one of the most philosophical questions we can ask. But how we answer it will also have important practical implications. If someone has died, a respectful disposition of the bodily remains is generally thought to be appropriate. To bury or cremate a human being who is still alive would be extremely inappropriate. But in past centuries, people have from time to time been shocked and dismayed to discover that someone who had appeared to be dead and was therefore placed in a coffin for burial was actually still alive, desperately trying to get out. And mistaken declarations of death have even been made by emergency medical technicians in the past few years. The question of what should count as death has more recently become intertwined with the question of when it is appropriate to harvest, as they say, such life-critical organs as hearts or livers that have been donated for transplantation. A plausible answer is only after the donor has died. This requirement has come to be known as the dead donor rule. The thought here is obvious. To remove organs critical to life before the donor has actually died is to kill the donor. But Dr. Robert Truag of Harvard is among those who have challenged the dead donor rule. To see why, have a look at Truag's essay, Is It Time to Abandon Whole Brain Death? Now, most people do accept the rule that organs critical to life must not be harvested before the donor has died. But unless the organs are harvested very soon after the donor has died, they are not likely to be sufficiently viable for an organ recipient to enjoy the intended benefit. For this reason, potential organ donors might wonder if they will eventually be declared dead even before they have actually died in order to hasten the removal of their organs. So we can see that there is practical as well as philosophical motivation to arrive at a clear understanding of what ought to count as someone's death and to develop reliable methods for establishing when death has indeed occurred. So let's return to our question. On what basis should someone be regarded as dead? As a first approximation, we might say, well, as soon as the heart stops beating and the lungs stop breathing. But this answer no longer seems right. Methods are now available for restarting these functions and maintaining them by external means. Maybe we should say this instead. Someone has died when and only when circulatory and respiratory function cannot be maintained any longer, even by external or artificial means. This has certainly been one prominent view. Death as the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function. Sometimes, however, heartbeat and breathing can be maintained by technological means, even in the irreversible absence of any and all brain function. Is a human really being kept alive? Or should we say this instead? While various organs and tissues can be maintained in a reasonably viable condition, the human being, conceived as a whole living organism, has indeed ceased to exist. Now, according to what has come to be known as the whole brain death criterion for establishing death, a human being is dead once the whole of the brain has ceased to function, even if heartbeat and breathing can be artificially maintained. The brain, it is claimed, is the chief integrating organ. Thus, when the brain is no longer able to function, the entity that remains is no longer capable of achieving sufficient integration or organization to constitute a genuine human organism. Now, over the last four or five decades, all 50 states and over 100 countries around the world have adopted the whole brain death criterion as the basis for the legal determination of death. Some would say that the move from circulatory respiratory death to whole brain death is one of the greatest contributions of modern bioethical thought. Others would offer a more cynical interpretation. Once the notion of whole brain death is in place, a body can be attached to intensive care mechanisms but these mechanisms would not be regarded as life-sustaining. When the organs are actually needed, they can then be harvested in significantly better condition than they would have been otherwise. But medical personnel removing those organs would not be responsible for thereby killing the donor. After all, on the whole brain death conception, and despite the connection to what is often called life support, the donor had already died. So is whole brain death just a way to keep people alive while claiming they are not alive? so that donor organs can be removed in better condition? A philosophical defense of the whole brain death criterion was made by the 1981 Presidential Commission report, Defining Death, a defense not conceived as a mere rationalization for increasing the supply of viable donor organs. But some philosophers and physicians, for example, Peter Singer, Dr. Robert Truag, have argued that this defense fails. 
both say that for a biologically accurate understanding of death, we should return to the more familiar idea that death is the irreversible absence of circulatory respiratory function. But they also suggest that this in turn should lead us to acknowledge that being biologically alive is not in and of itself a morally significant state. Life as such has no intrinsic value, according to these authors. From this claim, each of these authors goes on to draw some controversial practical implications. Now, finally, the whole brain death approach has been criticized from an entirely different direction. Suppose most of the brain has died, but the brain stem is reasonably intact. Spontaneous breathing might yet be possible, but the capacity for consciousness has been permanently lost. Is the individual we have known and cared about really still there in that mindless but breathing body? Or quite tragically, do we have only the biologically semi-functional bodily remains of what once was but no longer is that individual? On the view that has been called the higher brain death conception, death just is the irreversible cessation of the capacity for consciousness. A human body in a provably permanent vegetative state is not a living human being in any morally relevant sense. Now, the terminology here may be a little misleading. To be alive on this view, an individual need not exhibit higher levels of intelligence or deeper wisdom. What matters is that the upper or higher part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, is sufficiently functional so to support at least a modicum of conscious awareness. So which understanding of what death is should guide public policy? Try to arrive at your own critically reflective conclusions about this critically important matter.